Hey everyone, and welcome to the K Zero LWC Ham Shack uh, tonight. Super, super, super excited to have Andy Wang joining us. Uh, and Andy is a PhD doctoral uh, candidate at the University of Sydney. And I want to make sure I get this correct, Andy. You are a doctoral candidate in uh, astronomy and astrophysics. Is that right? Yes. Perfect. And. Um, I'm super excited to have you on here because I know you're very busy. Um, you and your colleagues and um, all this wonderful work you've been doing for, what has it been the last last year, year and a half? How long has this work been going on that just got published? About a year. About a year. Uh, I mean, you guys were making international headlines all over the place with this amazing story about this mysterious radio signal that you guys have found uh, in the Milky Way that is unlike anything has has ever been seen before. It's it's very perplexing to, I think, a lot in the astronomy uh, and astrophysics community. But I first want to talk a little bit about you personally. So again, you're a PhD candidate. Uh, you're doing your research right now and talk about what a, a heck of a thing to have on your resume, uh, this awesome discovery of what you found. But what what got you interested in astronomy and wanting to become an astronomer? Like what, what got you into that? Well, I got, got to observe the sky when I was a child. I, I got to read books about astronomy and I got the pictures from NASA. So I just I just think it would be a good idea to become a astronomy or at least a researcher in astronomy in the future. Uh, so that's why I choose astronomy as my like major in the undergrad. And after that, I I learned something basic about the astronomy during that four years. Uh, and uh, there is a course about radio astronomy, uh, but unfortunately, I didn't I didn't like have a well understanding about radio astronomy. So I choose to come to Australia to to try to figure out like how radio astronomy is actually work. So that that's that's a reason like why I choose astronomy and especially to specify in uh, radio astro astrophysics. Awesome. And for you, and I know, again, there's, it's not just you, there's a large team, of course, you have your advisor, etc. I mean, how has this experience been for you for for making this discovery of something that a lot of people have never quite seen before in the field of astronomy? What's this been like for you as a PhD student to, to go through this and find what you found? Oh, uh, to be honest, at first, it's really and exciting and exciting things to find. And it is really interesting to find such, such of the sources. Uh, and, uh, but after that, like, given that this source is a unique source, uh, we didn't know this kind of source before. So uh, what we did first is actually to check if the source is real or if the property of the source is real. Uh, otherwise it might be some like some artifacts or some bad data to cause the this unique signal. So after that, we did lots of like investigations uh, to confirm the the signal is real and the property of the signal is real. Uh, and after that, we need to do lots of like monitoring of the signal to to catch up more information for the signal. Uh, but as, what, what causes uh, artifacts, Andy? Like when you talk about it could be a false signal where it's not an actual real signal, what yeah. causes things that could be fake? Is it like noise out in space that you're picking up? Is it something from the instrumentation on the telescope? Where would that come from? Right. You, you're, it comes from the instrument or it can come from some like maybe mobile phone from 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 some other people in the <laughs> like in the telescope site. Also, it can be something like if there is a bright source nearby, there is something called like a side lobe that can be some fake, fake sources. Uh, so we need to double check uh, the source is real, but uh, we see the source for like for three to four times the first time it, we have discovered it. So we think it is real. 
And when I know that we have uh, some radio telescopes here in the United States where they have a quiet zone around them where mm-hmm. you can't have forms of electronics and radios and cell phones. And I'm sure that the telescope that you are working off of primarily is in far western Australia, which I imagine, not having been there, must be fairly remote, I assume? Yes. Uh, the ASCAP is also located in a real quiet zone in Australia. Uh, but there are lots of like satellites or plane passing through. So it can be some uh, transmitter from the uh, airplane or satellites. So we need to figure figure it out. That's interesting. I mean, does that is that a common thing where you get random radio signals or, or interference from satellites or from planes that are overhead? Like, is that something that commonly you as an astronomer have to go through and basically make sure that those things aren't happening with your data? Is that common? Yes. Like, for, for example, if we see something like a spike in our uh, data, we might just remove that part of data since because we think it is something like called uh, real interference. So we, we need to remove the bad data, even though we might remove some good data, but the uh, logic for for our data reduction is it is a bad, better idea to even flag more good data than leave the bad data in your data set. Yeah, I said it's almost like in our world of ham radio, it would be what we would call like noise reduction and things like that, where we're trying to eliminate the things that we don't want to hear in our receiver. Um, You're kind of doing the same thing of getting rid of the extra noise or things that might be interfering. We do all kinds of things in ham radio that we're trying to get rid of noise and interference because we just want to hear the signal that we want to hear, much like what you're saying is like we want to make sure that there's no interference. Um, So we, we definitely have that in common. And I think that's a great segue to talk about you know, how a radio telescope works in a basic sense. Because amateur radio, our hobby, where we're using RF to communicate, there's so many subsets of the hobby, one of which is there's lots of amateur astronomers in our hobby that like to have backyard telescopes and observe things. But from a very basic standpoint, a radio telescope is basically uh, collecting signals from space, amplifying them a lot, allowing you to see very, 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 very faint signals is that right andy yes yes correct so you really like we we receive the signal from the sky and we use something called amplifier to uh, amplify the signal and trying to uh el- eliminate the noise and trying to make our detection more significant and does that amplification happen and like, is it a piece of hardware? Is it a box on the antenna array? Or is it something that is really more of a software or a computer-based thing? Well, I, to be honest, I'm not sure. I'm not an engineer, so you can check the details in the web, web, website. I think I, for, for either ASCAP or MIRCAP or even VLA, you can check all the instrumental side on their web page. Perfect. I said, we'll definitely do that. Because I said, we again, we share that in common. Like It's a very similar scenario for us, but we're just not pointed up at the sky typically. Although people in ham radio, we do cool things like we'll take our signal um, and bounce it off the moon and have it re- reflect back to Earth and do all kinds of weird stuff like that. But So that's basically what we're doing. We have these big arrays, and we were talking a little earlier about uh, off-air you know, a single dish, right, is just one antenna, one telescope or one mm-hmm. radio uh, telescope. But a lot of t- stuff today seems like there are these VLAs where they are multiple dishes all lined up in a pattern or are spanning a, a large area. So bringing those all together, is it better to have a bunch of radio telescopes or a bunch of antennas all together? Or is one giant one more um, advantageous or better for your research? Is there a preference? Uh, well, actually, it, it depends on what co- what aspects you are working on. Uh, for example, if you are working for like, for searching for pulsations from the, uh, from the sky objects, it would be a better idea to use a single huge telescope to do that. But if you are trying to get a wide field of view and try to image the sky in radio wavelength, it is a it, it is a better idea to use 
a lot of antennas to form a interferometer to to observe the sky. So it just depends, like you said, on what kind of research or what kind of things you want to listen to, which yeah. one might be better. And when tell us how this came about, because, again, this was so exciting. Um, you can literally search if you just go to if anybody here wants to open up a new tab on their browser right now and just type in radio signal into like Google News. You're going to see Andy's headlines pop up all over the world with this discovery. Um, it's just incredible. Talk about how you found it in the sense of what was that moment like or when did you realize that you found something really unique with this mysterious signal when was that that aha moment uh uh perhaps i'll just like introduce something about uh, like how we actually set the signal so the the way we search for this kind of signal is trying to find sources that on and off or the brightness uh, goes rise and down, something like that. Uh, and we found this uh, signal. And also we found like maybe seven or eight more such kind of signals like that is rise and uh, goes rise and down. Uh, but what is special for this one is it is like a circular polarized. So usually we, we can detect like 5,000 sources in one observation, but only maybe like five or 10 of them are circularly polarized. So it is a unique source and it is a unique source that is circular polarized and it is variable. Uh, so that's why we just picked this one source up to do further investigation. And we all, all think it is a very interesting source to do any further analysis. And when you look at the source that is, like you said, circularly polarized, and you said that, like that, it's not like it never happens, but like you said, out of thousands or hundreds, like it's very uncommon. Like it does happen, but is the uniqueness that usually they don't appear and go up and down and kind of oscillate in their brightness and then go away and come back? Is that what makes this really unique and hasn't really been seen before with that circular polarization? Well, well, to be honest, it is not a unique property for this signal because like, in the future we will do, like, we, we have done lots of other investigations, but just for it is circular, uh, circular polarized and it is variable, uh, we just think it either be a star or be a pauser, like a dead star that, that rotates very quickly. Because uh, like, even though like, even if it is a star or pulsar, it is a very interesting thing to discover, especially like for star, if it is, uh, if we can detect a radio signal, that means it is probably a, like something we call M the wolf, which is like our song is a M the wolf. So, which means we might say, we might can use that techniques to find some stellar similar to our song. And also, like for polar side, uh, any new find in polar or any new dis discovery in polar will have a very significant influence on astronomy side, because uh, polar is a good place to confirm the relative uh, reactivities. So any find in terms of this highly variable and highly circular polarized will be interesting for us. And when you were doing this, I know that we were talking earlier, you know, it's, it's you, but then there's other people that become involved because when you find something like this and you discover it, you know, it's, you, you have your site out in Western Australia, but there's other sites, whether it's in Australia or other parts of the world that then turn and look and see if they can also collect data on this. Talk about the collaboration that you've had with others when you were going through and working um, on looking at this particular area. Yeah, so first, like, we have our own data and we pick this source up from our survey and we think this source is interesting. Now, it, it is worth to do further follow-up observation, like further observations using other telescope or using some telescopes in other wavelengths. So we just think it is a unique source. So we need to 
propose a proposal to the director of different telescopes. And then the, if, the, if the director thinks uh, this source is a good source and there could be some good output from the observation, then they will approve our proposal. And then we can use the time to do the observation and to do like further analysis for this source. And how valuable is it for you as a researcher to have your proposals accepted at other arrays around the world to get you more data? Like how helpful is that for you? Uh, well, like, uh, uh, with more telescopes involved, we can get more, like, we can get more sites to uh, observe this source, like we can get many properties from different sites. Uh, so for example, for our telescope, uh, it is working from like 700 megahertz to about one gigahertz. But for, for example, the one of the telescope we use is called Meerkat and located in the South Africa. Uh, it is working mainly from like uh, something around nine nine hundred megahertz to about one point eight gigahertz. So it is working in different frequency, and the bandwidth is sort of different. And we can get different kinds of property for the source in terms of the frequency, and uh, especially uh, for the other telescope we use, uh, which is called ATCA, it is it works on like centered at 2.1 gigahertz, which is higher than the two telescope we use. So like it works on different uh, frequency and we can get more data for this signal. Uh, and like more, more data and more chances are for us to interpret the origin of the signal. And when you think about this particular signal, that you were looking at in this instance, the one you discovered in the survey, what kind of, because when we think about it in ham radio, you know, we're thinking about, oh, the frequency is 3.873 you know, megahertz, or it's this specific frequency. This, what you're looking like was not one particular frequency. It was, it was a much more broad banded signal. Is that right? Yes. I mean, you're, you're like, uh, the time we dis uh, we discovered the source, we used a telescope with bandwidth of about three hundred megahertz. And for the one which is called Meerkat, we use something uh, about eight uh, about nine hundred megahertz. So which is much broader than like a single megahertz bandwidth. Yeah, and there's a. There's a question here um, that just came up we can address in real time and you can, uh, you know, ask questions of Andy is, I mean, SETI, which I said I know has been, um, I think, on the downswing in terms of this, of course, is a, a large, you know, you know, really focused effort here in the United States. Are they involved in this? But who, who have been your partners in your research that's been helping with this particular signal? Uh, so, sir, I didn't catch the, your questions. Sure. So what other organizations, is it universities who are involved in helping you analyze this data and collect this data moving forward? Who else are you working with collaboratively uh, for your, your research? Yeah, well, it is a wide, it is a worldwide collaborations for this kind of discovery. Uh, and we, uh, like our collaborator from South Africa, from France, from United States, like we use different kind of telescopes to help us to identify the source. So it really is a, a large worldwide effort. And is it primarily other universities um, that are you're working with in this? Or is it other, is it like private organizations? Like who are the collaborators? Is it universities? Yes, it is like something like universities and uh, observatories. Uh, in astronomy. All right, perfect. And um, I know that when you were looking at this signal, um, you were talking about the differences between 
different kinds of satellites and what they can get, like how much they can collect on a survey or can they get really deep, faint signals, right? What do you think is going to be the future of this discovery? And what I mean by that is, you know, this is something that really hasn't been seen before. And of course, I think a lot of people immediately, they snap to the judgment of like the, the obvious question, is it aliens? Like that's the thing you always hear, right? But really, this is about the technology that we have and these antenna arrays are getting better and better and better. And you're able to hear things through your research and what you're doing on these surveys that we've really never been able to hear before. So we're going to discover new things. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Yes, actually, uh, with the development of the new instrument, we are able to cover more sky. Uh, that means we can detect more sources. So the more sources we detected, the more chances for us to discover some new objects. And I mean, how much, because some people might wonder, well, we've had radio telescopes for a while and we've had like what the Arecibo Observatory and and PR, right? Like we've had these big things for decades, but are we still discovering because the technology is improving stuff like this that is new and never been observed before? Like, is this happening on a more frequent basis thanks to the technology improvements? Uh, Well, yes, I would say yes, guys. Uh, in terms of the de- development, we can like, get a higher time resolution, which can help us to discover something like fast radio bursts. And we can also like have a higher frequency, like frequency resolution, which can help us to identify the like the uh, spectrum of the source. So these are two characteristics for our radio astronomers to uh, identify a source. So with more advanced instruments in these two sides, we can detect more things. So that for us, it is it means we can explore more uh, parameter space. So we can have like maybe a shorter time scale and a higher frequency resolution. And the question that somebody had brought up that we had on the screen was about SETI, which is the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence project here in the United States. And it was using, um, you know, a large part of that project was distributed computing, where the bits of data are sent out to people through this network and their computers at home would look and analyze and do calculations and put things together and then send them back, right, to the radio astronomers. Have you guys done anything like that utilizing distributed computing or are you guys using some kind of supercomputer at your observatory to actually crunch the data together? Right. So we use the like uh, what is called high performance computer uh, in our university also in the observatory to help us to like uh, to make the searching more faster but it is not like searching a huge amount of data so we can just use our own machine to do that. Uh, also, we use one of the telescope used in SETI, which is called PARKS. Uh, we use that telescope to search for uh, positions, like to search for like any short time scale variation for our source. And PARKS, that's a that's a, a telescope in Eastern Australia that was a part of SETI, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah, so that was because you guys were in the one on the western side, and there's also parks on the eastern side of the country. Very good. Um, so talk about the moment again when you realized that you found something really unique or that this was going to be potentially something that would be really, really important to your field of study. I mean, was there, was there a singular moment where you were like, wow, this is freaking cool? Like, was there that moment for you? Yeah, especially after the detections from the Meerkat, I'm very excited because we've been waiting for about three months for a single detection. So it is just something that feels like a relief. So we feel like, ah, we finally get a detection. Uh, So we are uh, sort of tired, but we are very excited about that since we find something new. 
And I'm thinking back to um, many of the movies that you see, right, in Hollywood, which, of course, are rarely ever like real life because they're they're a movie. They're supposed to be crazy and fantastic and just over the top. You know, when you see somebody in the movie sitting behind a desk full of computer screens and all of a sudden there's a flashing light and a buzzer going, eh, eh, signal detected. I'm guessing it's not really like that in real life, is it, Andy? Uh, well, and that that is something we are going to do because, like, if you are trying to hear some sounds from the alert, that means it is sort of a real time detection. So, like, we know whether the detection, uh, like, we can get the we can get the data reduction in a very short time after the observation. But for now, we our aim is to develop uh, a network or a software for us to make our data reductions quicker so that we can just say like uh, we we observe the source like maybe uh, yesterday and we can find the signals in a, a bunch of data just one day after then we can do a quick follow-up so maybe like even in the future if we have a very high performance computer it might be possible for us to do actually real time so that means like uh, the antenna just point to that direction and we can know whether there is, is a uh, very in interesting source just uh, when the telescope is pointing to that direction. So that is something we are going to do. But for now, we are just trying to uh, analyze the data as soon as possible, but it is not like real time. Usually there is a one month delay between the observation and the actual data reduction. So there is no blinking light with a, you turn on the speakers and you're like, what do I hear? What does the spike show on the screen in real time? The, yeah. But I, there's people tuning in wondering what the discovery was. And so just to resummarize for those that came a little late, you know, this the signal that you found in the Milky Way is, again, is behaves in a way that really hasn't been seen before. Circular polarized, right? It's, it's fairly rare um, and is uh, not known to be kind of this way in, in that it's it's really, again, new for the radio astronomy community. Um, and again, thanks primarily probably to, again, just this instrumentation gets better and better and better and that you guys can really see unique stuff. I mean, when you, back to your point we were just talking about, um, and again, you can Google news search, um, just look up a radio signal right now. You'll find every story internationally around the world about Andy's research. You can read about it as we talk. Your when you're doing your research, you mentioned that, you know, when the, the radio telescope is pointed in that direction. So obviously you're not the only one doing research at these arrays, right? There's other people utilizing telescope time. So is that what the software that you're talking about is intended to do to where if somebody in Australia, in the Western Australia, um, one that you primarily work at, if that one is doing some other work elsewhere pointed in the sky, that somebody else in the world is pointed at that specific region to see if it comes back or comes on all of a sudden. And again, your telescope is pointed in another direction. Well, because like it, you can't be looking at that specific spot all the time, right? Because it's probably doing other work looking in other areas, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so to be honest, like we, we can't cannot use full time to just observe this sing, single spot to do our observation, but we can use any antennas uh, that can cover this region to do the observations such as the like the Vail A in Australia uh no in America. Yeah, and like like I said, I think the collaboration piece is so interesting in that, especially now with your paper coming out, there's probably going to be other radio astronomers around the world that are going to be intrigued in this specific signal, this specific area that they will be maybe wanting to look at it themselves, specifically what you found, to see what kind of data they can collect on their own in other parts of the world, right? Yes. Yeah, they can do that thing as long as uh, I publish the paper. Uh, and especially uh, like now there are several uh, groups are working on trying to modeling the signal and try to uh, understand what is happening behind the signal. And so what is the modeling 
gonna tell you? What what is that modeling gonna do? What's it trying to understand? Well, uh, I'm not not a expert on modeling, so I will just say some very simple things. It is sort of something like uh, we can assume some models, such as uh, we can assume whether it is a uh, it is a binary or how how much the magnetic field are there in the object. And then we can do something like uh, trying to do the fitting with our light curve and the model and trying to figure out like what's the parameter uh, for that kind of sources. And after that, after we get the parameter, we can discuss whether the parameter makes sense. Uh, if, for example, if the uh, magnetic field is much higher, it's so high that it cannot exist in the real life. Uh, either it might be a very interesting thing or so, but in most cases, that means this model does not fit for our object. So it is just sort of something like this. And when you talk about the signal that you found, is it, is that particular signal something that we can hear audibly like your data could you put it into an audio file and listen to it can you hear that signal audibly with the ear mm, unfortunately we can't because we don't have a high quality high resolution data uh, even though we done powder searching with a very higher resolution but we didn't find any like a short time scale variation which means i like, the data is dominated by the noise. And uh, the better quality data we can get is with a time resolution about eight seconds. So for eight seconds, if we turn it into a audio, it is hard for us. It is impossible for human ear to hear. It is sort of something like a 0.1 hertz, which, which is much lower than the uh, frequency we can hear. So yeah, unfortunately, sure. so no. Yeah, it's subaudible to the human hearing in terms of what our ears can actually hear. And yeah, that's, I said it again, back to the movie part about <laughs> where there's some guy who's got his ear up to a speaker like this listening and he's like, I can hear the signal. And again, oftentimes, <laughs> depending on the signal, that's not always the case. But a great question here um, for you, Andy. Mm -hmm. uh, how long are those raw signals saved that you guys are collecting when you're out there, right? Those, that raw data, how long are you holding on to that? And also as these detection algorithms improve, are they then rerun on older signals that have already been collected? Well, uh, again, I'm not an expert, but I know something basic about this. So, Usually, the raw signals are not saved for a longer time since, like, uh, even for the reduced signal, like the the signal has already been reducted, there are a, about terabytes per per month. So, for a raw signal, it can be like thousand terabytes, might be. So, mm -hmm. it can consume lots of storage to do that. So, usually, we don't keep the raw signals for a long time, you will only keep the reduced signal. And the, I'm not sure about the time scale, but you really, it won't keep for longer than 10 days. And of course, like as the detection algorithms improve, uh, it is possible to rerun uh, the, the data reduction on the uh, old, old signal. But as what I have pointed out, uh, it is not the very raw signal. It is just something like after reduction. Uh, so maybe it won't uh, reveal anything interesting, but we might find something new in the old data, uh, but it is not from the very first data. Sure, that makes sense. Another question here um, from Joseph, I'll put on the screen for you, Andy. Uh -huh. um, are, and we, we've covered a little bit about this, but Joseph may have joined late. Are these signals wideband? So again, what, what frequency range is this particular discovery that you made? What was the, the range of that frequency? Um, and is it a, a regular pulse with the signal? Um, so those are Joseph's questions. Mm -hmm. So the, for the first questions, uh, yes, uh, these signals are wideband. 
so far, we have detected the signals uh, from 700 megahertz to about 3 gigahertz. Uh, and for any more frequency, we haven't used the antennas to do that. So we are not sure whether there is actually a, a cutoff in the lower frequency or it is just there is still a detection there. Uh, but we will do the further analysis, like the further observations in lower frequency. And for higher frequency, because uh, our source is like what is what we call is a steep spectrum, uh, which means uh, it is it has a higher frequency in low, uh, it has a higher uh, brightness in lower frequency, and but has a very lower uh, brightness in higher frequency. So that means it is hard for us to detect the source in higher frequency. So, so far we haven't detected the source in like C band, X band, uh, but we have detected detect the source in L band, uh, like 2.2 2 gigahertz to one gigahertz. Uh, and we haven't seen a regular pulse of the signal. So we hope to say like, if we see pulsations, uh, the pulse interpretations is a very likely origin for the signal. So we hope to see that, but unfortunately, we didn't see that. And I think I know the answer to this just based on the conversations that we've had to this point, Andy. But again, there are people in our hobby of ham radio that they they get into amateur radio astronomy, right? They, they have backyard setups. Some of them might be fairly... Um, you know, expensive, elaborate from a personal standpoint, right? They might invest five or ten or twenty thousand dollars into these setups. But um, again, I think I know the answer, but I have to ask you: This is only something that, with the the highest level of sensitive equipment like what you're using in these world class observatories, that's the only way you're going to hear this kind of signal that you've discovered, right? Yes, unfortunately, I would say yes, because uh, the signal is much weaker. So it is really hard for a, a very basic antennas to receive such a weak signal. Uh, but however, if you have a backyard radio telescope, uh, you can use that to observe the sun or the Jupiter. Uh, they are both radio emitters. So it is a good object for you to use your own antennas to observe these two objects, but not for this one. And what do you think the future holds, or maybe what you hope that it holds for the kind of arrays that are being built right now, right? Like, I know the Australia one isn't that old. And if I'm not mistaken, China has a pretty e elaborate, really nice, um, I think it's relatively new, right? Um, radio telescope in China, is that right? Yes. Uh, they built a, like, a 500 aperture meters radio telescope. Uh, but the, like, so with a wide diameters and with a uh and with a like more uh, advanced uh, receivers it can detect the source with a uh, very f weak signal but the downside for for that uh, antenna is that it can only observe part of the sky uh, that means like the, the the dish of the fuzz cannot move so that means it can only see like just a stripe over the sky. So it is something limited. So like in the future, I know like in, in US, uh, they are going to build a, a radio interferometer with about hundreds of antennas, uh, which can uh, with with only like maybe ten to twelve meters in diameters. Uh, it has a wider field of view and it can move very like it, it can move it can observe like a much huger range of sky yeah so there's kind of two different telescopes if i'm right andy where you have these arrays where you need them to have a wide angle field of view if you will where they're scanning big swaths of the sky looking for and detecting a lot of stuff to see where should we be looking in these wide areas that it's able to listen? But then you also need a place for like the more large, huge antennas that are very sensitive because those are the kinds of places where they're really going to be able to dive in and hear 
very faint signals and really they're more about sensitivity under a very small area where the other ones at the beginning of the process are more about finding areas that those more sensitive ones should be focused on. Is that right? Uh, yes. So you, you already use like a, a array to perform a survey, like right? we can cover more sky, but for a single dish, we can get more deeper. So that is the advantages for, uh, maybe, not, maybe not the advantages, that is something like a, a trade-off between the single dish and the uh, real interferometer or a, a array. Yeah, because I remember we, I've seen an array a, f a few times. I used to live out in the western part of the United States. We had a few arrays like in New Mexico, which is a state in the southwest part of the country. Um, and there's an array down there. And um, yeah, so those are the those are the wide angle lens of photography, if you will, of the sky and listening to what's going on. Whereas those single dishes are like the <laughs> the guy with the amplified headphones putting the parabolic dish listening into a very specific area. I have a question here from Joseph Andy. How were you able to make an educated guess about where to, to survey to look? Like, were you pointing at this part of the Milky Way and for any particular reason, like of where you wanted to survey? Was there a reason behind surveying that area where you found this? Uh, uh, yes. It, it, uh, to, to be honest, like for astronomy, we want, want to cover as much area as we want like the, the more area we cover the more discovery we will have uh, but unfortunately we only have like a limited time on the telescope so we need to figure out uh, what is the best position to uh, to point the telescope to uh, that means like we need to find the uh, the region with uh, estimated uh, a fruitful output. So Yuri Galactic Center is a really good place for us to find real transits. Uh, uh, we have found lots of some uh, lots of things like powders uh, in that region, and we we are going to find more powders in that region because uh, we think there should be more powders there, but we only discover uh, fewer than the estimations. And also there are lots of stars uh, at the like uh, near the galactic center. Uh, so Uri's uh, stars can produce really emission in uh, like in a variable way. So we that's a reason why we point the telescope to near the galactic center. So the galactic center is uh, is is like the the known fishing hole where there's lots of good stuff and we know that there's interesting stuff there typically so it's a, it's always a good place to look because you know you're probably going to find some 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 signals of some kind right yes yes and so that's that's an interesting thing because like you said like where you point it it could be anywhere and i mean how many signals because this came of course from the milky way which you know, I said most people at least know of the Milky Way, um, if you even have a basic sense of the sky. How many things come from something like the part of the Milky Way that you're looking at versus maybe something that's way distant, way off somewhere else, like deep, 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 farther off the map? Like, is it is it more common that where you are looking, like you said, Galactic Center, to get these kinds of things? Or like... What's the ratio between finding signals where you expect them in the galactic center versus maybe something that's more obscure? Uh, to be, like, I, is it common to get like really <laughs> signals from like other galaxies, like way, way, way out, like in other areas where I said maybe it's it's even tougher to to listen to those kinds of signals. Like, do you guys get into other galaxies and going way, way far out in terms of your signal detection? Uh, well, like uh, we have lots of service uh, use the ASCAP. Uh, some some of the pointing are point towards the further galaxies. We are trying to find something really 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 far but for this source like for this region i'm working on it is a uh, focus on the uh, galactic center part uh but however there are there must be some sources behind our galaxy that means it is possible for us to observe the source uh which is very distant even though we're pointing to towards the galactic center uh but uh what we found 
suggest uh, this signal is from the might might from the our galaxy. Do you have a sense? Do you guys know how far this is away from Earth? Do you know that calculation? Well, we, we it is hard for us to determine the distance. So if the source is located near the galactic center, it is about like twenty six table uh, like uh, thousands light year away from us. But given that we cannot constrain the distance. Uh, pretty good. So it, it, it is a, a difficult question. Also, it is something we really want to know. Like with the distance information, it will be good for us to better understand the source. And when you guys are, are doing these surveys, um, if you think about the night sky as you look up, maybe when you walk outside the observatory in Australia, right, and you get that beautiful night sky and it's just super dark right and you can see all these beautiful stars when you're doing your typical survey um, that you're doing at your at your observatory what percentage of that visible sky that's above your head are you capturing in a single survey just guesstimate yeah about uh i actually i have done the calculation it is about like for for the full sky like for the whole spheric it is about 0.07 percent it is pretty huge, like, even though you think it is less than 1%, but for us, it is really, really huge. Like, usually, like, for an optical, our survey region is about, like, thousands times bigger than an optical observation. Uh, you, we can cover about 30 square degrees, which is super big. Yeah, I said, I mean, that was... Um, I said I was curious to be like, is it going to be like 10% of the sky, 5%, 1%? Um, so I said it was, and again, I don't even have, I can't even, I can't even picture that in my mind and like, it can't even wrap my head around it because I said, I just don't know what, like you said to you, it's really huge, but I'm like, that's really small percentage, <laughs> but the sky is a big <laughs> place at the same time, you know? Um, yeah. so it's hard to wrap my head around it, but the, like, what's, What's next for for this particular signal? Like you're going to, of course, be um, going to be graduating with your PhD hopefully next year. Um, what's next for you? What's next for the signal now that it's published and it's out there for other astronomers around the world to to know about? What do you think the next year or two with this particular signal? What do you think will be happening? What will be the work going on? Uh, well, like because. Just like we only detect this sort, this signal in real wavelengths. So what we are going to do is to try to focus on the radio wavelengths only. Uh, like we will, we are going to propose a real a proposal to observe the source, and we also going to continue to use the ASCAP to monitoring the source behavior. Uh, and hopefully we can figure out the like any periodicity of the signal. Like if we know the periodicity, it will be good for us to plan the further observation. Uh, and also it might be a good idea to do other wavelengths follow up. Uh, but given that we didn't find anything in other wavelengths, so it might not be the top priority, but more data, more more chance. Well, I was going to say, uh, spoken like a true scientist, more data, more data, more data. The yeah. more data, the better. <laughs> Absolutely. And um, as again, if, if people are joined late, they may have missed the beginning of it. We actually kind of already answered this and touched on it without actually really getting into it. But I'm going to re-ask you the question again and we can recover it. Um, I, I just got to ask you straight, Andy. Is it an alien trying to make contact? No, uh, I would say no, because uh, it is a broadband. It spans from 700 megahertz to 3 gigahertz. Uh, you're a human or aliens, you already like sent their signals in just a very narrow band, but our signals span from a huge bandwidth. So it is highly unlikely for this signal to be alien. Uh, but who knows, like, 
it, like I would say like we, maybe we have like 0.001 percent to be aliens. Because yeah. like to be serious, we don't we, we we are not able to say it must not be something, uh, but it is highly unlikely to be an alien. Oh yeah, I said it. in the scientific community, certainty is 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 a very different thing than it is for people who are not in the scientific community. So I like your point zero zero one percent chance. Yeah. I like that. Um, yeah, it's it's likely not that. And like we talked about at the beginning, it's just the advances in what kind of technology that you're utilizing to look at the sky. Um, you know, we're hearing things, seeing things that it sounds like we just never have been able to because it just technology is getting so much better. So there are going to be new discoveries and new signals um, that come along because now we have this, these great telescopes um, that can do things that have never been possible before and they can do them faster and they can listen to them at even a, a, in a noisier way. Right. And eliminate that noise to and hear things that they could never hear before. Right. Yeah. So and it, so that's, it, that's that's why it's not uncommon that we're going to continue to see more signals discovered because our technology, just like everything around us in the world, right, as technology advances, we're going to be able to do new and cool and exciting things. Right, yeah. Perfect. Hopefully well, there will be more advanced antennas in the future so we can get more discoveries. Well, hopefully you're not picking up any FT8 signals, and that's a ham radio joke for many <laughs> radio viewers out there um, from any of our stuff. Because I know that the worst thing that could probably be for you and your data set is to have one of us with some kind of transmitter anywhere near you while you're doing work. Because um, mm-hmm. we talked about how interesting it was. I never thought about airplanes um, and the things that they emit, or just even, like I said, just having them around and what that may cause. By the way, this just popped into my head as a question. By the way, for those viewing, if you have any last minute questions for Andy, ask him now because we'll be wrapping up in a bit. But this just popped into my head. You have a radio quiet zone around you know, where you're doing your work. But is there also essentially a no fly zone? Is there a, like, please don't fly over this area where the telescope is? Is that even a thing? Or is it just the radio quiet zone only? Uh, just radio quiet zone only. So plane can't fly by. And also the the one more thing is that even though a transmitter is far away from the the site, it can also influence our data. So that is a nightmare for us. But with the development of our human beings, it is something we we cannot avoid. Yeah, I was gonna say it's it's we think of it the very same way. Where we have these radios and these equipment and these antennas outside, and there are so many things in the world that you know emit noise and radio frequency interference, um, and EMI and RFI, and it drives us and our hobby nuts too because we just want to communicate and talk to one another, and somebody has you know a smartphone wireless charger down the street that's pulsing noise broadband and it's destroying the ability to to hear anything. I said, it's a very simple problem for us, a much larger and more important problem for you because while it affects our ability to communicate um, and it's an annoying thing for you, it could potentially be ruining your data set which would be just terrible because if that happens where you get interference that just randomly comes into your data, I mean, could that potentially destroy days, weeks, months of work? Well, well you're, you're really just flat, flat, flat out the data which is affected by the, like, for example, the, the mobile phone. Uh, you're really, it just can't, it usually lasts for about just 10 minutes or so. Uh, the, uh, the interesting is like the mobile phone is just has a very narrow bandwidth, like the the emission. So it is easy for us to just flat out that part of the spectrum so that we can do use other frequency to do our science. So you can kind of work around that even if that comes into your data, you have ways to kind of eliminate that interference or that problem so that way it's not totally ruined. Yes, but of course, like, the the gas influence the like, the the better for for our data. Yeah, you still don't want it. Like you want to avoid it at all costs. Absolutely, where it's you know the perfect scenario. Here's a question that came in for you as we get ready to wrap up, Andy. Um, uh, here, studying engineering in college, do you think learning about radio frequencies? 
Um, and really studying them, learning about them in depth is something worthwhile. Um, if this person really wanted to do aerospace or do anything in astrophysics, maybe in grad school, do you think, uh, you know, learning about radio frequencies is a worthwhile thing given the kind of research and work that you do? Does it, is it helpful to know again, all about radio frequency in your line of work? I have to imagine it is. Uh, well, to be, to be honest, I'm not familiar with the radio frequencies at the, uh, at the beginning of my research. But to be honest, it is a, a good idea to learn something more. Oh, and, and as always, if you have enough time, it is always a good idea to learn something more. Okay? Even though you learn something not actually close to your subject, maybe in the future it can you can use some ideas from the other subject to use in your own field. It, it might be a very good idea to do science. Yeah, absolutely. I could see how, again, like um, if there's people in your uh, world of astrophysics and um, astronomy that have a, a ham radio, what we do background, I could see where there's overlap or just interesting tidbits that could be helpful. Another question that came up was, is anyone ever talked about or is there a plan to have a radio telescope on the moon or get it off of Earth to basically, I'm assuming, get it into a clearer area where it's not as worrisome for interference? Has that ever been a thing? You ever heard of something like that? Yes, correct. So there is a there's now there are a bunch of meetings about building telescope on a moon. Uh, you're like. Uh, one thought is that we can use of the mountain on the moon to use as a dish as the telescope, but we need like it, it is something we we are planning to do. Uh, not maybe not we like the astronomers planning to do because moon has the very perfect uh, environment for real astronomers. So yes, it is one of the things uh, astronomers trying to do. I have to imagine that that would be a massive collaboration across the entire world for something like that. That's just an assumption. Yeah. Yeah, correct. I mean, because I mean, I just can't imagine that. I mean, it just be an incredible project to accomplish. But I said a worthwhile one um, and that uh, that that could be something that we see in the future, which is pretty wild to think about. But then again, you know, just this morning, I'm, I'm sitting there working and seeing people launch into space for a couple of minutes and then come back down again, which. I never thought I would see in my lifetime that just average people can go shoot up into space at 250,000 feet. So, again, technology advances and the world advances, right? Um, but, again, if you're just joining as we close out and you're curious to the story, because it's made international headlines all around the world yesterday. And, I, Andy, I'm sure you're just getting inundated with media requests and emails to answer, uh, and both from your colleagues around the world and media outlets. Just go to Google News, type in radio signal discovered. You'll see I lost count of how many outlets around the world have covered your story, Andy, and your research, which is amazing. Um, and I said, it's, it's so cool. I said to still have these great articles and great research coming out like this, because I think it just helps inspire the next generation of astronomers um, and those that work in science because uh, the exploration, the trying to discover the unknown, um, I think is something that's still so needed in this world. So to have your research that you've worked so hard on during your um, doctoral uh, existence there at the University of Sydney, it's really, really cool to see it getting all this attention. Because again, I think there's some kid out there that could be reading that that article at, you know, from some major publication, and that is what gets them interested. And maybe they take the same track as you and they discover a signal, you know, 30 years from now. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I think that's that's super, super cool. So, um, Andy, again, I know you're super busy. I know you're in the middle of your day over there um, in Australia. So I just want to say thank you um, for joining uh, and be willing to talk about your research and, and talking about it in a way that at least I can understand, not being, uh, I said, an astronomer in any way. So I really appreciate it um, and the time that you share with us. So it's so great. I wish you all the best as you continue this work, um, as well as collaborating with your colleagues around the world. And again, just uh, just thank you so much. I really appreciate Appreciate it. Yeah. Also, thank you for giving me the this opportunity to share the share our uh, our research. Absolutely. Well, again, best of luck in the future, Andy. And uh, I said maybe I'll be looking for the next headline you come up with. Who knows? Maybe you'll find some other I said crazy <laughs> signal out there. We'll have to have you on again. 
Yeah. All right. Thanks, Andy. Have a great rest of your day. Yeah. Thanks. Bye. Bye, Andy.